Okay, well, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, when I was invited to give, uh, give a talk here at Grand Rounds, um, I was discussing with Dr. Goldenberg about the content of the talk. And he wanted me to present an overview of the analytical pharmacology core and profile some of the clinical applications which um, may be relevant, certainly to this audience. And it occurred to me uh, during that time that, that many of the, most of the time when we're looking at clinical talks, when we're looking at seminars in general, uh, they're full of uh, explicit content in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the graphic nature of the slides, particularly in the clinical uh, world, and, and in addition, nudity and this sort of thing. And I thought, well, for the purposes of this talk, I'll, I'll in fact rate the talk and give you a little bit of an idea as to what, uh, what the content will be. I'm profiling the analytical pharmacology core. Um, however, many of you probably don't in fact um, know me, know my background, know where I came from. And so I wanted to start by giving you an idea of who I am. I was trained in the UK. I did my bachelor's in chemistry and pharmacology at the University of Liverpool uh, back in 1993. I went on to do a PhD in steroid drug metabolism with, at the University of uh, Liverpool. Uh, stayed on for seven years there with uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Park and David Back, and um, then migrated out to Canada, where I here to the BC Cancer Agency, where I conducted a postdoctoral fellowship with um, the advanced with advanced therapeutics and Marcel Bali and Lawrence Meyer there. The focus being multi-drug reverse, reversal agents in preclinical development and uh, work with a company um, on to do from California there to uh, develop some of their small molecules targeted to MDR and P-glycoprotein. In 1999, the Prostate Center recruited me. Um, I was asked to develop a, a, a program on complementary and alternative medicines, which, considering my background, uh, uh, developed into a natural health products research program um, and was recruited to faculty in surgery in, two, in the year 2000. Uh, I've subsequently been fortunate enough to secure more than $3.5 million in PI reviewed peer funding, sorry, PI reviewed peer reviewed funding and um, as being part of a team, uh, such a, a, a brilliant team of scientists at the Prostate Center, I'm also co-investigator on um, grants worth more than $40 million, and I think we can thank Dr. Glee for that. I'm currently head of the analytical program um, for the pharmacology core, and as I mentioned, head of the natural health products research program. Uh, I think many of you are probably aware of the core facilities of the Prostate Center. If not, I'm going to broadly outline them here. We have a tissue microarray facility headed by, um, where are we? Here we are. Uh, GPAC, specialized in molecular pathology. Array facility, Gene Arrays, headed by Colleen Nelson, the Translational Trials Core which is uh, Dr. Glee, Dr. Goldenberg, Kim Chi, an animal facility, and the newest core, which is mine, and that is the analytical pharmacology core, um, where I'm responsible essentially for drug and xenobiotic analysis, assess formulations, conduct pharmacokinetics analysis, pharmacodynamic confirmation, or target validation, as well as do metabolite screening. And this all works in nicely into the, the natural products research um, program which I had, um, as well as uh, many of the collaborative ventures which I've been involved with over the years since joining. And in 2003, I was fortunate to, enough to secure a new opportunity CFI grant worth $350,000. This allowed me to purchase some leading edge edge equipment at the time for analytical research, namely um, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry equipment. I will go into this in more detail and discuss 
broadly um, the technical application of this. Uh, but what this allowed me to do was then uh, conduct collaborative research, use it as the mainstay tool in my technical in the technical aspects of my program, but also do contract research, which could be industry-linked as well as investigator-initiated clinical trials. And today I'm going to describe some of the more clinically or uh, pertinent um, uh, studies which are maybe relevant to some of your clinical practices. So the analytical systems I've listed here, um, they're, to you it's probably, it looks like a, a bunch of technical jargon, it is marketing after all, and this is a lot of the, the equipment we, put, public, we purchase from Waters, the Waters Alliance system, coupled to a 996 PDA detector and Quattro Micro, probably doesn't mean a lot. But basically what I have here is, um, I have a, pr a a suite of analytical tools which will allow us to quantitatively and qualitatively analyze a complex mixture of compounds and identify individual compounds from those with um, a, quite a precise degree of accuracy. Now, in terms of the um, uh, separations module, or the ability of the instrumentation to um, to uh, separate uh, individual components, we need to conduct chromatography up front of the mass spectrometry equipment, and I'm going to describe to you broadly what this is, what essentially uh, our equipment does. It's called high performance liquid chromatography, and it it assures the chromatographic separation. It uses a two-phase system, a solid phase and a, a mobile phase. The solid phase includes the pump component, which pumps a mobile phase around the circuit, an injector, which uh, injects uh, your sample onto the system, the column, which is essentially the solid phase material that allows separation of the different chemical moieties and that subsequently the detector which allows the, uh, the differential um, identification or the, the specific um, uh, detection. In this case we're, we're using mass spectrometry. Our mobile phase is pumped around the system as I'd mentioned and it looks something like this. I'm going to leave this up for a couple of seconds so that you can, in fact, digest it. But what we see here is um, our two reservoirs of mobile phase, which are, on, are essentially uh, solvents uh, developed and optimized for each individual protocol that we're, we're using for um, the analytes of interest. The pump um, pumps the mobile phase around the system through the column and into the detector. At this point here, the injector is injecting the um, analyte of interest. I'm going to wait till this comes around again here. Injects the analyte of interest onto, uh, into the system. It's forced through by the mobile phase. And each of the individual compounds are separated according to the chemical physical properties on this uh, column, which again is, uh, is packed with materials which are uh, able to separate um, and which we use optimally, select optimally, to separate the different compounds. And here it's been ma made very simple in, the, in uh, the way that we're looking at simply blue, uh, green, and red. And you can see here that the detector picks up each of the compounds and separates them ideally with baseline separation according to uh, what we're seeing on our readout. Now this is a, an HPLC chromatogram. This is our workstation or interface on which we're collecting this data and what we're seeing here on the x-axis is the time or the retention time, the amount of time it takes for each of the compounds to be looted from the column and then our, our uh, method of detection, in this case UV absorbance. 
and we're seeing a um, nice sharp peaks, good resolution, and the three red, green, and blue uh, compounds are looted here. Now, this is simply the chromatographic separations module. Uh, the detection uh, phase of the system is, in fact, one of the, well, of course, the, the chromatography is, is critical, but the mass spectrometry allows us to definitively assign a characteristic um, fingerprint to each of the individual compounds that we're interested in. What, did it, what the LCMS system can do is um, essentially ionize uh, the molecules of interest, allowing them to be picked up in a, in a number of, uh, of ways. But essentially, when you hear the terms quadrupole, ion trap, orbit trap, time of flight, these are all um, mass spectrometry uh, technologies which can essentially do the same thing, and that is detect compounds sequentially according to their mass. The compounds are ionized, and the different detectors, or MS systems, are able to pick up the mass to charge ratio, which can then be deconvoluted by the software and picked up by our data stream here. So what we're seeing in terms of the whole data stream of the system is this chromatographic separation up front. And then this feeds into our mass spectrometer, which ionizes each of the compounds. And we are able to individually, mon individually monitor single ions and record them sequentially or simultaneously in this fashion here, some of them with better resolution than others. We can now feed this into uh, obtain a, a molecular weight and assign that to each of the compounds. Then if we're clever enough, when we put some of these instruments in tandem and use um, uh, triple quadrupole or tandem mass spectrometry, we can then uh, further fragment, further select these ions, f expose them to um, high voltage, fragment them further, and we create a very individual and characteristic fingerprint, which can be then spectrally compared using databases and assigned to um, specific molecules. OK, so enough of the technical introduction. What are the applications of some of the, of the technology that we have within the core? Why are we, in fact, um, uh, doing what we're doing? Well. Um, Firstly, we've, uh, we're able to um, look at, um, certainly, drug compounds. Many of these compounds are not readily available. We're, we're looking at compounds which are often embedded or, or bound to protein and serum. We're looking at compounds that are excreted in urine as well as tissues. And so what we have to do is um, do a drug recovery or an extraction procedure up front. But ultimately, we're able to um, quite efficiently now uh, recover compounds with uh, significant extraction efficiency and, in fact, uh, provide pharmacokinetic data to, um, for clinical trial purposes. In order to be able to do this for FDA or investigational new drug applications, we've reached a level of compliance now, which is according to the FDA and Health Canada guidelines for good laboratory practices, or GLP. And so if you hear something about the GLP lab at the Prostate Centre, this is essentially what it is. And what it means is that um, by being affiliated or grouping with uh, the investigational drug program here at the BC Cancer Agency, whose quality assurance umbrella we, uh, we fall, we've been able to um, ensure a certain level of um, laboratory practices. We ensure standard operating procedures for all aspects of laboratory operation when we're uh, conducting clinical trial sam uh, uh, sample analysis. We have all the study documentation in place, anal for analysis, as well as the archiving. 
and the sample accrual and uh, collection. We've undergone test facility inspections and, and uh, all of the equipment has essentially been up to um, uh, specification or, or certified to be up to specification for operational um, uh, use. And so having said that, I'll move into uh, a couple of the, the examples I have for the clinical trial sample analysis that we've conducted so, for, so far. We've looked at two clinical um, uh, trials in particular. We worked with Kim Chi and Martin Glee with these. The uh, first one where we looked at a phase one dose escalation study, looking at the safety of um, OGX011 in combination with docetaxel. And I think many of you know OGX011 is um, an antisense oligonucleotide targeted to clustering. Uh, the purpose of this study was to determine safety and tolerability of the combination, and we were uh, required to look at the pharmacokinetics of docetaxel and see whether or not they were in fact influenced by this combination. The second study was a study of, uh, again, OGX011 in combination with gemcitabine and cisplatin, and similarly, we were looking at drug-drug interactions there and seeing whether or not there was a shift in the uh, profile of either gemcitabine or cisplatin when we co-administer the OGX011. This is really important from a toxicity perspective in being able to preempt um, adverse drug reactions from a drug-drug interaction uh, basis. And so you can see that we have a, a variety of, of, um, of uh, chemistries that we're dealing with here, uh, ranging from a small macroma, macrolide or ta uh, taxane uh, molecule through to some of these smaller and yet more challenging platinum derivatives. And we've been able to optimize now uh, with um, a great degree of, degree of accuracy and precision uh, docetaxel, gemcitopine, and cisplatin protocols for LCMS. And subsequently, create a data set something like this for the uh, clinical investigator who. Um, who op optimally or um, ultimately is interested in this, our, in this readout. And that is that we have developed, or we can map out our pharmacokinetic um, uh, profile for each individual patient and then come up with a series of pharmacokinetic parameters such as Cmax or maximal plasma concentration or serum concentration. Uh, the half-life in the serum, the area under the curve, and so on and so forth. We're able to do this for not only docetaxel, but also gemcitabine, similarly creating pharmacokinetic parameters um, as such, as well as each, product, each um, profile for the individual patients, and cisplatin. And what this allows us to do is then go on to compare pharmacokinetic profiles and parameters for individual patients and compare those with um, uh, patients who've been administered drug alone uh, compared with those administered the uh, chemotherapeutic in combination with the OGX011. Any shift in, uh, in parameters might be indicative and uh, we can um, uh, project the likelihood of a, a potential drug-drug interaction with the combination of the two drugs in that way. The purpose of cisplatin, we'd have to, we've had to uh, do a, a confirmatory um, analysis using atomic absorption spectroscopy and similarly obtained uh, very reproducible uh, and sensitive results. So in, in summary, uh, some of the method development challenges that we uh, have been facing are stability of the compounds we're dealing with, uh, dissolution or, or, or getting a good recovery from the biological matrix of interest, in this case serum. 
However, we're not restricted to only analyzing drugs or, in fact, analyzing drugs from serum. We are currently gearing up for our next GLP study, which we're validating our protocol, and sample accrual has begun, and that is in collaboration with Paula Brown, who's the co-investigator and so with Lynn Stobbers here, and we're looking at anthocyanins in urine uh, derived from the cranberry. And just to give you a broad overview of some of the work that we've been doing with Paula Brown on this, uh, on this project, We've been looking at individual uh, compounds or markers of the cranberry juice in urine and optimized our assay to pick up, um, at least in this case, four markers of um, anthocyanin content in the cranberry and consequently in the urine so that um, the study PI can then go on to examine compliance um, uh, of um, administration of the, the material. In this case, the cranberry juice. What the PI can also do is to look at the background levels of cranberry or anthocyanin in the patient urine and, um, and potentially use some of that information as well. We're also able to look at bio, bio, uh, biologics, um, namely the, uh, the antisense oligos. We're able to look at um, molecular weight and match the specification, see whether or not this matches specification of material that's been developed uh, for targeting um, uh, purposes and whether or not we in fact have a high or low impurity content in material we're using for preclinical studies, but also look at uh, tissues derived from subcutaneous tumor implants. Um, in this case, we were looking at a tumor model that was a subcutaneous xenograph and doing a tissue extraction and quantitating the amounts of oligo that were uh, available in this tissue distribution study to the tumor. So moving on to a study which I've been working on with Colleen Nelson and a graduate student in our lab, uh, Jennifer Locke, we've been looking at steroid content in um, xenograft tissues again and uh, come up with some really interesting results. We've been looking at uh, the fact that uh, Recently, there has been a trend in the literature suggesting that there may be a significant quantity of uh, androgenic steroids in androgen-independent uh, prostate tissue in men who have already undergone chemical uh, castration and who are where we're seeing a progression to androgen-independent prostate cancer. We're seeing significant ser uh, tissue levels of testicular, uh, sorry, tissue levels of androgens despite the absence of testicular androgen formation in this case and also in, in spite of the absence of serum uh, 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 testosterone or, or DHT. And what we, uh, what we decided to do to investigate uh, this finding in the literature was to determine whether or not these tissues were actually capable of synthesizing their own androgens. We used a model to represent the clinical uh, progression of prostate cancer. Here we're using the LINCAP xenograft tumor model upon chemical concentration around week five we typically see a uh, reduction in the expressed serum PSA and consequently a rise uh, in the PSA reflecting progression to androgen independent disease. What we did in this case was to take, harvest the tissues from the xenografts uh, at around week eight to nine when the PSA was indicating this uh, progressive event. And we 
essentially extracted that tissue, used our LCN methodology to um, analyze whether or not there was testosterone or DHT in this tissue upon castration of the animals. What we've been able to do is develop a highly sensitive um, uh, analytical method where we're able to look at low picogram per mil uh, levels of testosterone and DHT in this assay. And we were, in fact, able to demonstrate that these animals are um, certainly displaying higher or significant levels of testosterone and DHT in their tissues following castration and following a, a time interval uh, indicating progression which is, uh, mimics the course of clinical prostate cancer. Um, this is reflective of what uh, is currently out there in the literature. So we went back to our stereogenic map and this indicates uh, this, this slide is essentially uh, summarizing the stereogenesis pathway through from cholesterol by downstream steroids mediated by a series of steroidogenic enzymes, CYP11, 17, uh, CYP, uh, hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, so on and so forth, which are responsible for the conversion of cholesterol through its downstream steroids, uh, uh, ensuring the biotransformation to testosterone and DHT. Now, if, this, if the prostates or tissues, you know, graft tissues, were in fact able to create or um, uh, generate their own steroids, many of these enzymes would have to be present in the tissue. And we've now, in fact, demonstrated that, that many of, uh, using Western blowing techniques, that these enzymes are in fact present. And so uh, from a functional a metabolic activity perspective, we might expect this tissues to be able to produce steroids. Alan? Mm -hmm. No, it's a very good question. And I think that um, adrenal synthesis has been ruled out in the mouse because the mouse is unable to generate adrenal androgen. And so this model is actually a, a perfect example of how we can, uh, of looking at, at steroidogenesis in this, in this tissue type because we we can actually rule out adrenal antigen here. The pituitary was signaled to the testis, so the testis has been removed in this case. Um, the pituitary really only signals to the, uh, the steroidogenic tissue. In this case, we're trying to de determine whether or not the the prostate itself is is able to do that, and previously this hadn't really been, hadn't been shown at all. And so, really, quite an exciting finding. What we've been able to do now then is put in the building blocks for steroids into an ex vivo culture of androgen independent link up cells. These are derived from those animals which have been castrated and then allowed, for the, allowed their tumors to regrow. And we've taken those cells and uh, bathed them in um, uh, C14 or carbon-14 labeled acetate, cultured them over 48 to, to uh, 36 to 48 hours, and allowed them to um, essentially build steroids. And we can see here, and using our LCMS technology, we've been able to show the formation of novel steroids uh, over this time point. Um, and not only that, we've now shown that, in fact, DHT is present and uh, formed in those cells when they're fed the building blocks of steroids. 
and radio-labeled DHT uh, has been shown to be formed in those tissues. So I think we've, we've quite um, nicely demonstrated that the, the prostate tumor tissue itself can, can generate steroid. We then decided to go from the top down and look at some uh, already established steroids, progesterone in particular, because we've been able to demonstrate that progesterone levels in these models during AI progression is significantly elevated. And so we then took our, our uh, ex vivo culture and administered progesterone into that culture environment. And we've been able to show here again that when we do a fractionation of that uh, chromatogram that we've generated there, we generate a series of steroids. And interestingly, some of these steroids, although we know according to the fragmentation pattern that they are steroids, we, we don't actually, we're not able to definitively assign them. Um, and so this suggests that there may be some isomeric um, or novel uh, uh, moieties being formed here. So um, in summary, we're able to measure castrate levels of, of testosterone and DHT, and this is something that really uh, breaks the, the paradigm here. Uh, the thought that typically the uh, castrate levels of, of steroid in the prostate are, um, well, the whole purpose of doing a performing castration is to block steroid content in the prostate. And um, using our radio label and mass spectrometry uh, technology associated with fragmentation uh, characteristic assignment, we've uh, quite nicely shown this. And we're currently preparing a manuscript for, ca for cancer research to demonstrate that certainly in our hands, our tumors are able to generate substantial levels of, of, uh, of androgen. So moving into some work now where we've been looking at herbals and contamination with, uh, with drug, we've been working with Neil Flesher in particular at the, Prince, uh, the Princess Margaret Hospital who was interested in screening a panel of drugs marketed, or rather herbals, marketed for erectile dysfunction, suspecting that some of these may in fact contain PD-5 inhibitors, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Uh, this uh, series of drugs have been uh, known to have a dramatic effect on treatment of erectile dysfunction over the years. Uh, many herbals have been marketed with similar claims. And uh, we were interested in looking to see whether or not there was, in fact, contamination or adulteration of these products. We've been able to develop a highly sensitive and reproducible LCMS assay using standards as references and taken a panel of drugs, uh, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, to screen for the most popular uh, ED um, PD-5 inhibitors, and here I'm, I'm showing the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, spectroscopy that we're able to obtain using our LCMS e equipment. You can see here when we screened a panel of seven uh, herbal products that two of them have demonstrated demonstrate significant contamination with our standards. When we then go to fragment those further using our tandem mass spectrometry uh, uh, technique, we can definitively show that, in fact, this compound here, uh, uh, sildenafil, which is Viagra, is, um, is lacing, essentially, our herbal product B whereas Tadalafil here is lacing our herbal product F. And uh, very interestingly, when we did a quantitative analysis on each of the, uh, the content of the, 
the, uh, the drugs in the herbal product, we're able to see that they were almost spot on within the therapeutically, or, or rather the, uh, the dose recommended for uh, optimal use here of 30 milligrams per capsule of the sildenafil and 20 milligrams, which is actually on the high side for tadalafil, um, which obviously has, uh, uh, is pretty shocking and has uh, significance in terms of the life-threatening consequences if taken in combination with nitrates. And a lot of the time, individuals may not, in fact, uh, disclose to their, their doctor that they're taking an herbal um, uh, substitute for a PD-5 inhibitor. They're often warned against PD-5 inhibitor use because of cardiac problems or concurrent problems with nitroglycerin. And so you can see there, if we're taking nitroglycerin in combination with PD-5 inhibitor, we have a potentially fatal drug-drug interaction. So you can see the public concern here and certainly the relevance to clinical practice. It's relatively easy for us to, to actually detect and analyze quantitatively the presence of these compounds. So. Um, you know, if, if any of you do suspect that uh, your patients may be taking something, if they do in fact disclose that, and you want to look at something, you want to screen for, for drugs within any of the herbal products, we can actually quite quickly and easily develop methods to do this kind of research. We published this, um, this study in the Journal of Urology back in 2005 and consequently attracted a lot of media attention and, uh, and rightly so. So moving into toxicology and some of the alternative medicines that I've been working with, um, not necessarily something that uh, uh, capitalizes on the technological aspects of the LCMS uh, equipment, but certainly is, uh, is part of our, our role here, and that was to do a toxicological Call evaluation, the high pH therapy, which is an uh, a alternative therapy rich in cesium chloride. This is something which has been developed uh, in the mid-80s by Dr. Keith Brewer, and he markets an alternative, or he did, marketed an alternative medicine or treatment which was based on the fact that there was a prevalence of cesium chloride in the diets of indigenous peoples living in volcanic areas, and that this was associated with a low cancer incidence. Now, he was, in fact, a trained scientist and uh, chemical or physicist, in fact. And he uh, theorized that cesium chloride could, in fact, alkalize intracellular pH of, of cancer cells upon uptake, and that this increase in pH could limit cancer cell growth. Now, these patients, or the patients who subscribed to this alternative therapy, were given or recommended to um, administer, self-administer a dose of six to nine grams of cesium chloride per day. And you can see this is quite an alarmingly high amount of material to be ingesting with relatively little toxicological um, knowledge. The cesium chloride was recommended in combination with selenium, vitamins A, B, D, and E, some of which are micronutrients known to have an impact on cell proliferation and limit uh, cancer cell uh, growth. So we conducted an acute toxicity test of this material in a dose escalation study in three models, the LINCAP model, which represented in our hands here the androgen-sensitive prostate cancer xenograft, it's a human xenograft, the PC3 xenograft model, which represents androgen-independent prostate cancer, and non-tumor bearing animals. We administered them once daily, orally, in a 30-day dose escalation study, doses mimicking, uh, reflecting those equivalent to uh, six to nine grams in the human, going up to 1,200 milligrams per kilogram body weight. 
We measured the tumors weekly. We measured the, the body weights uh, daily. Food and water consumption was monitored. Kidney and liver function tests were conducted. And the animals were monitored for, for obvious signs of acute toxicity. And uh, we took those animals out to 30 days. So in summary, the animals with uh, PC3 uh, lung cap tumors uh, uh, had a significant uh, drop in, in body mass. However, interestingly, those without tumors didn't. The food consumption was uh, indifferent throughout the, the, the group. The water consumption, however, significantly increased in the mice bearing PC3 tumors and the mice without tumors. The lingcap tumors, in fact, it, uh, I put no difference here, but in fact, many of them lost too much weight to be able to complete the study, and so it was difficult to evaluate that parameter. The tumor growth, interestingly, did significantly reduce in the mice bearing PC3 tumors. However, there was no difference, so we weren't able to monitor to the, the day 30 the lingcap tumor growth and the, the, probably one of the most interesting findings of this study, and one which I wanted to raise to your attention today, was an interesting and, and somewhat serendipitous finding of what we term to be bladder crystals, which fully um, uh, fill the content of the bladders in many of these animals. Those who are administered the lowest dose of 300 milligrams per kilogram didn't tend to form the bladder crystals or, or gel. I haven't called them stones because they were actually more crystalline. And upon discussion with, with Ben Chu here, we, we decided to do an, a full analysis and try to find the, what the content of those stones were. We, um, we saw there they were highly prevalent, and in fact, this uh, the the missing bar here in the 600 milligram per kilogram dosed animal set um, is because we weren't in fact looking for this on the onset of our study and my technician serendipitously came across the, the, uh, the, the, the crystals. We don't in fact remove the bladders in these studies. This is what the bladder crystals look like. Um, this is giving you an idea of the size of the crystals. And when we took our, our material out to Ursa Belli at UBC in pharmaceutical sciences, he was able to characterize them using IR spectroscopy as cesium magnesium phosphate hydrate. And so you can see that uh, our mice certainly, uh, when taking high levels of cesium chloride, are creating these, um, uh, these bladder crystals and um, something that uh, not only uh, should we be aware of in individuals who are seeking alternative therapies, or such as the high pH therapy, but also alongside some of the more recent evidence which suggests long QT syndrome in some of these individuals. Um, we've published this material now in, uh, in prostate and um, feel that it should be uh, widely available information out there, certainly with Health Canada. So in summary, we have a broad range of chemistries in the repertoire of the protocols we've been able to develop using our LCMS. Um, I digress slightly there at the end. I did want to raise the, the, the uh, cesium chloride issue to your attention. We have developed and can develop highly sensitive methods from a variety of biological matrices including urine, serum, tissues, uh, for research purposes. Uh, we were able to do, uh, conduct qualitative, quantitative analysis on these materials, create comprehensive pharmacokinetic data sets uh, using good laboratory practices, or GLP, as required. We were able to track metabolites through formation, um, both endogenous metabolites as well as drug metabolites. And certainly we have some very exciting new capabilities on the horizon with our imminent facilities expansion. 
This has been made possible by a recent uh, grant acquired by the, our team of scientists at the Prostate Center, headed by Dr. Gleed, um, in which we've been awarded a significant amount of money for infrastructure. And for my core, this implies the uh, new acquisition of um, highly sensitive, uh, even better equipment, essentially, a Q-top instrument in which I'm able to now more rapidly and sensitively scan um, many of the analytes we're looking at and create accurate mass profiles. Uh, the nanoflow technology, uh, fluorometric detection, which means uh, a different kind of, um, of uh, chemistries that can be looked at. We're able to upgrade our triple quadrupole mass spectrometer and uh, these enhanced ca capabilities imply the following um, uh, opportunities for um, this kind of samples we can, we can analyze. Um, we're already doing significant uh, work in ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. We'll be able to do more sensitive analysis, and more, more analytes simultaneously. Uh, this will then um, obviously enhance our capabilities. We're going to be able to, and certainly we're currently working on um, uh, equipment out of UBC that will hopefully work with uh, uh, to train in lipidomic profiling, Akisha Wasson's a suite out there, and ultimately build a proteomic suite here at, um, at the Prostate Center as well well, we should be able to uh, uh, do developmental work, um, accurate mass and moldy uh, type proteomics work. But finally, I'd like to acknowledge all of the uh, expert and extremely um, fantastic individuals I'm fortunate enough to work with in my lab, Hans Adamat, who essentially steers the uh, uh, the mechanism. He manages our technical, the technical aspect of the lab, Captain Wood, and my research technician, Jennifer, who is one of the most outstanding PhD students I have been fortunate to work with, uh, con contributed significantly to the stereogenesis work. And all of the um, uh, my colleagues at the Prostate Center, as well as throughout uh, BC and, uh, and Canada. Finally, I'd like to thank all of the sponsors who've been able to make building of the analytical core possible, the CIHR, um, Canadian Foundation for Innovation, and CIC and the Terry Fox Foundation. And thank you for your attention.